I just don't understand this. <laughs> I need details, okay? So if there's something that you're not understanding, I need to know at what point in time did I lose you, okay? What is it exactly that got, that drew the confusion? Um, I do need to know those specific details in order for me to clarify anything, okay? Um, so if you notice in my comments on the discussions, I did say something to that degree, like, please be more specific. I need more information as to where you're confused, why you're confused, um, all that good stuff, okay? Um, so do you guys see my screen now? Okay, yeah. It was not showing. So, um, yeah, that's why I think in the, I don't think I said specifically, but I do need specific questions. So I had a lot of people say that they got confused on this one. No one was very specific as to where they got confused on this one. So I just wanted to kind of go over it again. So I'm going to play it. I'm only going to let it do like one step at a time. It's only a four minute part of the video. So it's not going to take too much class time to review it. Okay. But let me let the first part play and then I'll pause it when we get to um, a moment. Okay. So it might be a little loud. So just bear with me when I have to adjust the volume. Okay. Now, example four, it's going to be similar. We're all still going to integrate, but this one is a definite integral, which means I have bounds that I'm going to have to use at the end of the problem. So instead of once I integrate, instead of putting plus C, I'm going to remind myself I have to evaluate the expression. Before I can do that, let's write cotangent as a fraction. We are in the LN section, and before the LN section, um, typically you have to have a fraction because you want to have du over u in order to get an LN. So cotangent is actually cosine of the angle over sine of the angle. And since when you're doing logarithm, now I'm pausing right here because I did have somebody ask a question in the comments specifically. So they had a very specific question and I was happy about that. But the question was, is where did cosine over sine come from? Okay. And that is literally one of the trig identities for cotangent. Okay. So if you look up reciprocal identities, Um, you'll see there that it tell you that cotangent is one over tangent, but it also, if you look at trig, where is my trigonomic identities? And I believe I gave y'all a calculus sheet of paper, right? Yeah, let me borrow that. So I can put that on my screen. So this is not leading me nowhere. My little Google search is not helping me. <laughs> but on this sheet of paper, we do have these um, identities here. So notice right here for quotient identities, that's what it's called. You got it. So tangent is sine over cosine, and then cotangent is cosine over sine. Okay. There's not a whole bunch of identities that we will use, but we will be using trig identities. And that is something that's what? two courses behind ago, right? So unfortunately, <laughs> um, we do have to be able to recall those bits of information, okay? So that is where that little piece came from. So I just wanted to address that because I did see somebody ask that specific question, okay? Well, let me let it keep going. Is everybody good with that so far, right? Yeah, okay. It's usually u over u, the u is typically what's in the denominator. So I'm going to let u equal sine of theta over 9. Then du is going to require chain rule. So the derivative of sine is cosine of the same angle. And applying the chain rule times the derivative of that angle, which is 1 ninth. And again, we have to tag on a d theta because we don't know what variable we're integrating with respect to. So here, I do notice that if I try to substitute this here, um, I am going to have sine, which is u in the denominator, but I am going to have this term and this term left over. Now, I do have those here, but I have this extra one line. So if I multiply this equation by 9 on both sides, I will end up with cosine of theta over 9 d theta. Okay, now write 
there. Does anybody have any questions about that so far? You're missing the pie on the top 27 pie of the two. I am. I hope I put it in there later, but I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> yes, it is missing the pie on 27 pi over two. But with the u substitution, do you understand why I let u equal sign? Right. The whole goal is to get du over u, right? So you could say that it's ln. So if the u is downstairs in that formula, then that's what I want to let u equal, OK? And when we're trying to find du, we're literally just taking the derivative of that equation that we created u equal to sine of theta over 9. So the derivative of u is just du. And then the derivative of cosine of sine is cosine. But because the angle is not just regular variable, it's the variable over 9, that's why we had to apply the chain rule. OK? If it had just been cosine of theta or sine of theta, then my derivative would have just been cosine of theta. And that's it. But because it's not just theta, we have to apply that chain rule, OK? Sometimes it might be 2 theta in there. It might be theta squared inside there. Whatever it is, we would have to apply that chain rule, OK? Oh, I'm sorry. So oh, is, D, is du the cosine of theta over 9, or is it 9 du? Because that's where I got stuck, which is like, I guess, the next step from here. Okay, so du is cosine theta over nine times one uh -huh. nine times d theta. But since in my integral, I don't have a one ninth in there. So I cannot substitute for du yet because I don't have that one ninth. So what we did instead was we multiplied that equation that I have the arrow on, we multiplied it by nine on both sides. When you multiply it by nine on the left side of the equation, you just end up with a nine in front of du. Right. But when you multiply by nine on the other side, you end up with one ninth times nine, which is just one. And so that's why it's just cosine by itself with a little imaginary so, one coefficient. So we're still canceling nine. What do you mean by canceling? Well, I mean, because you said that it's going to be on one side and then we're going to have it again on the other side. Mm -hmm. so, Let me write it down. Yeah. Or maybe just, I guess, play it so I can try kind of to like right there. Because it is right there, like on the next step. Mm -hmm. Let me go back to my camera. So I have this. All I'm doing is multiplying this side by nine and this side by nine. So what happens here is it becomes nine du. And over here, the nines cancel. So I just have one cosine of theta over nine du theta but I don't have to write this one. It can be invisible, right? Okay. So nine du is what equals cosine of theta over nine d theta. And since this is what I have in the integral, this will become nine du because they're equivalent. Okay. Okay, okay. I'm gonna let the video play a little bit more, but let me close this first. So now I can substitute cosine theta over 9 d theta with 9 du. Then I can take the 9 out as a multiplier. Again, I need to note that this is just sign work. OK. Um, we will get 9. Yeah, I did put the pi back. <laughs> du over u which we know is just the ln of the absolute value of u. However, the problem is, is we can't plug these numbers in because these values are for thetas, not for u's. So we have to finish the whole integration process before we can do the evaluation part. So u, and sorry if I feel like I'm, if it feels like I'm yelling, I get really excited when I talk about math. <laughs> so sometimes my volume goes up a little bit, but <laughs> ignore it. I'm not yelling and I'm not frustrated. I just get excited. <laughs> it's actually sine of theta over nine. Now that I'm completely finished with all of the integration part, I- Okay, I'm gonna pause it right here. Does everybody see what happened from when I plugged in for cosine theta over nine d theta? 
since that is what I have here on the screen and it's equal to D nine DU, I just replace both of those with nine DU. Everybody's okay with that part? So since both of these match that, I can replace it with this, right? Because they're equivalent, okay? So that's what we have there. And then this is just a constant multiplier, right? We have that rule that we can kick the constant multipliers out of the integral altogether. So I just kicked it out of the integral to the front and it's still a constant multiplier, right? But now I have that form du over u and that lets me apply the theorem, right? So the integral rule says, if I'm taking the integral of du over u, it's just ln of the absolute value of u. And, but like I mentioned in the video, these numbers that they gave us were for thetas. So we do have to back up, right? When you use substitution, you got to plug it in and then you got to plug it back out, okay? You can't just leave it as used. Um, so the u, notice up at the top, the first line in my side works that u equals sine of theta over nine, doesn't it? So that's why this little u inside the bars became sine of theta over nine, okay? And then from there, I just plugged in, I'll let it fast forward a little bit. I just plugged in the 27 pi over two and then the nine pi over two. And since they had denominators down here, so I plugged this number in there and I plugged this number in there for theta, but both of them were dividing by nine, weren't they? And so I just simplified the fraction. And you could do that in the calculator too, I just didn't want to rewrite a whole nother line, okay? So I just reduced 27 by nine and it got three. So I'm really doing sine of three pi over two. But if you were to type this whole fraction in your calculator, it will spit back out three pi over two, okay? And I can show you, oh, I'm not worried about that. I don't need it till I'm leaving. <laughs> so I'm gonna go over to my camera just to show you how to reduce that fraction. So I had a fraction and then on top of the fraction, I had a fraction, right? 27 pi over two, but then below that, I was putting that whole number over nine, right? And so if I hit enter, it does tell me it's three pi over two. So if you can reduce fractions when they're all complex like that, like a fraction on top of a fraction, go for it. But if you're not great at reducing complex fractions, then please, by all means, just use the calculator to reduce it, right? I mean, shoot, I didn't even have to do sine of three pi over two. Oops, I don't know what button I pushed. <laughs> three pi over two. I could have also typed in that whole thing, sine of fraction, and then another fraction, 27 pi, not 37. I have that, what is it called? That fat finger syndrome or something, where your fingers are so wide, they just push all the other random buttons. I hate that, but it happens. Okay, and if I push that, it calculates the same thing. So you don't have to do is like all the little minor baby steps. You can just pipe in that whole thing. All I have to see on a test is that you plugged it in. So if I see this line here, I'm good. You could type in that whole entire thing in your calculator if you know how, okay? I don't, I like to do as much in my head as I can. And so that's usually how I work out the problems, okay? Is I try to simple it down as much as possible and then I use the calculator for something that I, I can't do on my own, okay? Or if I get too lazy too, that's okay too. As long as I see you plug in the numbers, you are totally okay to just use a calculator and give me that final, final answer, okay? Because on the test, well, when you see the review, you'll see all the formulas that you'll be able to use on the test because I have them in the review just the same as they are on the test. Then on top of that, um, it tells you on each problem that I have to see your integral, like for you to actually integrate it. So you have to find the antiderivative and then you have to plug in the numbers, okay? And as long as I see those two steps, then you're good, okay? But sometimes the step, the first step of taking the integral requires like multiple steps, right? Like right here, you use substitution, it's a little bit before you get to the actual evaluation part, okay? So does anybody have any questions about that one? Because I know that there was a little bit of confusion. I do have lots more today. So we're gonna be doing more with <laughs> um, integrals. I don't know that I have any trigs oh I do have a trig and then we go into the other ones that are just it's like after you integrate you end up with a trig right in 5.8 so we'll talk about those two but I wanted to bring this 
This was the one that had the most confused comments in the discussion. Okay. And it wasn't just in this class. It was in my online class too. So I know that this one's like a stacked rate. So you'll have like the online version, you have the face-to-face -face and then the remote. But I, across the board, there were different people in each section that had questions on that problem. When yes. You your assignments, do you change the online people too? Mm -hmm. or it's all online? together. Now, what I found out, it's too late now, but <laughs> what I found out was that I could have merged all the three Canvas classes together. And that way, when I push something out, it would have automatically been available for all three people to see, all three courses and sections to see. I didn't know that you could do that. So unfortunately, I have to have all three screens on my computer up and then whatever I do over here I have to do over here and then I do it over there and then I do it over here and then do it over here and then do it over there it's ridiculous but <laughs> I didn't know I could merge them together now I know so like I said it's my first time right teaching one of these stacked classes nobody's telling me all the tips and tricks just yet so I'm <laughs> just trying to figure it all out by myself my bag is in your online class you're who I do make sure I get paid and make sure I don't get fired. Oh, yes. He's in your online class, so we're always like, what are you doing on this? Are right, right, people? right. Yeah, they're very oh, much the same. Yeah. Oh, I think yeah. the online class might be a little bit ahead of this one, only because um, when I was out that one Wednesday, I think it was a Wednesday. And so that threw us off just a tiny little bit. So they might be a little bit ahead. Just a tiny bit, though. Because they're online. They're, they're, me being gone Wednesday didn't do nothing for them. But it did do something for the other two sections. Ma'am. So after the steps, we do like the day before we came to class. They're always due on Tuesday and Friday. Oh, okay. There we go. And if you if you miss one, you could still contribute. You could still go in there and comment, but you'll only get half of the point because I think it's like one point per discussion. But if you go in there later, oh. you could do it for half a point. Yes. Um oh, so can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Oh, great. Okay. Um, uh, example three. I had a question about that. Okay. Um, so in problem six inside the uh, homework, it had us add the power to the X to get the right answer. So you see how uh, it has, you have four over X LN or yeah, LN X, LN -X third. Uh -huh. Well, in the... And problem six on the on the homework, it actually had us put that power back on the X in order to get it right. Um, oh, it might have, well, I don't know. I'll have to look at your your um your stuff. But essentially with the logs of the rules of logs, you can put that three inside the log sum, and so you can take it out. But I'll have to look at your results. So I'll have to answer that particular situation once I get out of class, if that makes okay. sense. All okay. right. So I'll have to go and look at your responses and see what you were typing in there and what it was that it wanted. Because um, normally it should be taking both of them. But if it's not, I need to go in there and figure out what's going on. Okay. Okay. All right. But let me write your name down so that I don't forget. And then you said it was number six, right? Yeah, number six. So 5.7, number six for Mr. Quinn. Okay, thank you so much for bringing that to my attention. Sure thing. Okay, now I do have another kind of problem and I think it's one that's like one of the ones in the homework, which looked more like this, which was different than the one that's in the video, okay? So I don't know which one you were looking at, but I'm gonna go look at number six. <laughs> oh, actually, that, that was that's number five, but I this was number I, five. I had trouble with that one too, number so I'm six. glad we're going over that. Okay, yeah, we're gonna cover this one too. Okay, so um, let's see, let's see. So this is essentially the big rule. Now I think in the video I mentioned it in this form, right? The integral of du over u is equal to the ln of the absolute value of u. However, another representation of this would be to tear apart that fraction and to write one over u times du, okay? Because essentially this thing is like over one, right? And if I were to multiply those two things together, it would be the same as du over u, right? 
it's just sometimes I notice that when I peel stuff apart, it might be more convenient for me to see it like that and then do the integral, okay? It just depends on your viewpoint, okay? Um, there's rules and then there's all these properties and things that you can apply, right? And when you apply them and how you apply them is up to you as long as you do it correctly, right? Um, so for this one, I also had a good question and it was, do I have to do the long division um, when you see a problem like this? And they also asked me, was that long division process specific to this problem or is it a general rule that you should be doing long division? Okay, which is a very good question, okay? The reason we have to do long division is because I know that we're in the section of logarithms, right? And so we already know that our setup is supposed to have du over u, right? But think about derivatives. You basically have an original thing at the bottom, and then when you take its derivative, that's what's at top, right? That's what du means, is the derivative of the bottom, okay? When you take a derivative, don't you always take away one from the power? It's okay. <laughs> you always take away one when you're doing derivatives, right? So then the numerator, if du is in the top, then the numerator should have a smaller exponent than the bottom, shouldn't it? And right now I don't have a smaller exponent at the top, okay? So you basically you want du over u, but whatever his power is, his power should be one less, right? Because it's a derivative. And right now, here's my power of one, but that is not a power smaller than one, okay? That is why I have to do the long division because you want to get this, this fraction into an expression where there, and what would be smaller than one? Would be no x's, right? So I should have a constant in my numerator, okay? And so that's why we do that long division so that we can figure it out. And we're basically trying to rewrite the fraction. If you have N over D, you're gonna write, um, what is it? Your quotient plus your remainder over your divisor, right? So we'll do the long division. I'm actually gonna use a pen because I don't like the way the pencil reflects the light. So I'm gonna do my side work over here. Hopefully I have enough room. So my divisor is always going to go on the outside of the long division. And then the numerator goes on the inside of the long division. And two things before you start, I don't think they do that to us, but just in case, you always want to make sure that your divisor is in descending order. So like X and then constant, and that your numerator is in descending order. It was squared, one power, no powers, right? For X, it has to be in descending order. And so then we'll start the process. So I like to do it off on the side. I'm gonna use another color just so that I don't get, you don't get confused with what I'm doing here with what I'm doing in my head, okay? So in my head, what I do is I take this first term and I divide it by this first term. And two X squared divided by X is just two X, okay? And so then that two X goes up top. And then anything that's up here has to get distributed to these guys. So 2x times x is 2x squared and 2x times negative four is negative eight x. But when you're doing division with numbers, you always subtract that number, don't you? So that's why we end up changing signs. And I like to circle my sign so I know which one is the, especially when I'm just using one color, I like to circle my sign so I know which one I'm supposed to be using. So if I have 2x squared minus 2x squared, essentially that means there's no more x squared, right? But if I have 8x and I'm supposed to be saying plus 8x, then I actually have 16x there, right? Now my divisor has two terms. So when I multiply, I'm going to have two terms, right? That's the whole reason why we bring this guy down. And so that I'll have two people there when I have to subtract again, okay? And then I do that whole game again where I'm gonna take this front guy and I'm gonna divide it by that front guy and I end up with just 16. Since it's positive, I'm gonna put plus 16 up here. 
and then do that same um, distribution. So 16 times X is 16 X. 16 times negative four is negative 64. And then again, I should be subtracting this number, whatever it is, but I don't know what number it is because I don't know X, right? So this becomes minus and that becomes plus. So 16 X minus 16 X, those are gone. But negative four plus 64 is actually gonna be a positive 60. Now here's where it gets a little weird, sorry. Like if it's not all weird, <laughs> but this is your quotient. This is your divisor. It came from the denominator, right? And then this down here is the remainder. So essentially what you're doing is you're telling me that this thing divided by this thing is equal to the quotient plus the remainder over the divisor. Okay. So instead of integrating that fraction, what we'll do instead is integrate the quotient plus the remainder over the divisor. So instead of integrating that, we'll actually be integrating this. And don't I have what I needed? I needed a constant in the numerator, right? Because the derivative of X would just be a constant, okay? So then this becomes the integral of two X plus 16 plus 60 over X minus four. And then here you can do separate integrals where you write them out or you just integrate them separately in your head. That's all up to you, okay? For the purpose of teaching, I'm gonna separate it, okay? So if I were to separate this, it would be the integral of 2x dx plus the integral of 16 dx plus the integral of 60 over x minus four dx. And then I would take out all of those constant multipliers. So here the two would come out, the 16 would come out, and the 60 would come out. But I still have to have something in the numerator. What's supposed to be in the numerator if I took the 60 out? One, right? Because 60 times one would give me that 60 numerator. And then from here, we do our integral rules. So two times X to the two power over two plus 16 X plus 60. And since I do have U here, if I were to say U equals X minus four, what is DU? It just be one and then I have to tag on the DX, right? Isn't that the same thing as saying DU equals DX? right? So if I were to do my substitution, I would have one over u and then du. And that's exactly what I needed in order to apply this rule, isn't it? So I needed to have one over u times du to apply my rule, okay? You could have also visualized it as, oh, look, I have one over dx. Then du would go on top. Then now you have this form, don't you? But in either case, they're equivalent. So it doesn't matter which way you wanted it to look at that point, okay? So I did get this one, no problem. That's going to cancel. I'm just going to have x squared. But then here, I'm going to actually have ln of u plus c. And we know we can't leave the U in there. So we do have to put back what U was. And U was X minus four. Now it's in, it's in what is it? An indefinite integral. So I don't have to plug in any numbers to evaluate. I just have to tag on the plus C. It's only when there's numbers here, you have an extra step and you don't have this guy. Okay. 
So any questions on this one so far? I think I've got about four examples per section. I mean, if we get through them, we get through them. If we don't, we still have another day to finish up and review before we do the test on Monday, I think. Ugh, I don't like tests on Monday. <laughs> I don't like tests on Monday, but it just happens to fall that way. Um, only because I really don't like starting another section and then going back and doing the test just because it causes some confusion sometimes. So I always try to just like finish the section and give you the test and then we can go to the new stuff. <laughs> okay, um, so let's see. The next one, Justin mentioned that this one's kind of like number five on the assignment. So you might have a different power. I think that's really the only thing that's gonna be different here. And you're gonna have a power. And this one, it's kind of a giveaway because we noticed at the very beginning of the uh, use substitution section, um, normally if you see something in parentheses, that's usually the go-to for you, right? And so for me personally, that's what, my, what drew my eyes in. Not only that is that I know that the derivative of ln of x is one over x, and you literally have one over x there. It's just kind of in disguise, okay? If it helps you, I'll write it like this. Is that the same thing? It is, right? I just tore apart that fraction, okay? The factors of that fraction. And so then you know that the derivative of ln of x is one over x. And if you don't know, you have your derivative chart, right? So I would definitely be saying that u is ln of x, then the derivative of u is du, and the derivative of ln of x is one over x, but we always have to tag on the dx because we're integrating with respect to x. Here, the integral is derivative of u is actually one, but because we're integrating with respect to u, we had to tag on the d. So it's the same thing. I just don't usually write the one there. I usually just write du. So the derivative of u is one with respect to u. The derivative of ln of x is one over x with respect to x. But that can just be written as du. And now I have all the pieces that I need to do my substitution because I will have u in here and then all of that is du. And now it's actually not that complicated anymore, right? We could just apply our rule. So we have u to the seventh power over seven, no numbers. So we do tag on to plus c. But I'm still talking about u's, aren't I? And my original problem was not in u's. So I have to back sub. And u, ln of x. So this is actually ln of x raised to the seventh power over seven plus c. So that one really didn't use the rule that we had, but it was still an integral that involved ln, okay? So that's why this problem is still in this section because the whole section is about natural logarithms, okay? Now this one I'm gonna, again, just because it helps us to see better if we split it. So if I split this, it's actually gonna be one over x to the six over seven times one over eight plus x to the one seventh times the dx. Now here you may play around with who could be you because I have two denominators here, don't I? Right. So you might want to play around with what could be you. But for me personally, I naturally draw, and this was just, a, I guess, that my calculus teacher told me was that when you're trying to decide what u is, usually go with the more complicated looking thing. And then when you do the derivative, it'll look like the more simpler thing, okay? Between these two denominators, this one only has one term and that one has two terms. So this one would be the more complicated 
um, denominator, okay? So then I would say let u equal that denominator. And then when I take the derivative, well, the derivative of u is one, but with respect to u, the derivative of eight is zero, so I don't need to write it. And the derivative of this term is one seventh x to a power, and then with respect to x, what should be that new power? Eight over seven? Right, not integral derivative. You minus one, right? <laughs> yes, it's negative six over seven, right? One, oh my gosh, one over seven minus one, and I get negative six over seven. You got it. It happens. <laughs> and it, and I mean, it's not it's not abnormal. Even I did it sometimes when I was learning. Like, what 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 am I doing? Derivatives or integrals? <laughs> because you take away powers for derivatives, but you add the powers for the integrals, right? So you have to make sure you're keeping them. Which one you're doing straight? So um, this. Is I'm not going to write the one, I'm just going to write du. But this thing can actually be written as one over with a positive exponent, right? Using our exponent rules. Negative exponents mean they go on a different spot in the fraction bar, right? Since this is a whole number, then it's going to go to the denominator. But now you noticed I have that, don't I? I have these two parts, don't I? I just don't have this one seventh. So I need to move the one seven to the other side. So then I'll know exactly what to replace this with. Mm -hmm. Both sides. So I multiply this side by seven. I multiply this side by seven. That one cancels out, right? So I have seven du. And this is gone now. One times one is just one. But now I know exactly what to replace that with. So all of these two guys, are going to become 7du. And then this fraction is going to become 1 over u. So this is u. And then both of these guys together is actually 7du. And again, if you write this step, fantastic. If you don't write this step and you go straight into integrating, it's completely up to you, okay? But I would bring that seven out to the front. Now I have what I need to apply the rule. So it's gonna be the ln of the absolute value of u. And the problem was not in use, so I do have to back sub, right? What was u? Is that the eight plus X over one over seven? Yep, yeah, you got it. Oh. And now it's not in use no more. So this is the answer, good. I don't know why I'm getting scared that I'm not recording. I am, okay, good. <laughs> Every now and then I forget. Okay, any questions about this one? It was weird, but I think tearing it apart is what helps you to figure out what to do next. Did you have a question? I was trying to think of it. Sure, sure, sure. The, the parts where you multiply by seven, mm -hmm. is the rule just whenever, whenever it's not exactly going to match up with what we have as the original If problem. this side doesn't match up, I manipulate this side so that it does match, so then I know what to replace it with. So see, all these are multiplied together, right? I mean, I could have rewrote it. I could have kicked that over. Isn't this the same thing? Right, just swapping the two. So then basically I wanted some, I needed to replace that with something. And then of course we let that equal u. So that's gonna get replaced with something. 
But in order for me to replace this, it needs to look exactly like that on this side. So that's why I was manipulating it to make sure that it looked exactly like that before I substitute for it. Mm -hmm. Once they look exactly the same, then that's what I'm gonna put instead. And so that's what I put there instead. So see this became this and that guy became you. I think we have one more. Yeah, one more, but this one's gonna have trick. Everybody loves trig, right? No, <laughs> that is the worst class, I think. It's just my opinion. It's the hardest one. There's so many identities. Oh my goodness. They don't, you just randomly use one out of nowhere. So it's kind of weird. <laughs> it's like, oh, and this is the trig identity. And I was like, yeah. Right. You, know? <laughs> right. you just, you. You forget about them because you're like, I'm done with X. <laughs> you always. It's going to get worse. And I'm sorry, but it just is. This class is insane. To me, this class is the harder calculus class out of one, two, and three. Because you learn Cal 1, which is all derivatives. But then now in this class, you have to use all that stuff. And then you're doing antiderivatives. And the antiderivatives are not easy. They're not. I mean, you're doing them and they're not, right? They're going to get worse. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> like really bad. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I hope, I hope that I can make it seem like it's not so bad. That's my goal. Okay. But if you were to go look at chapter seven right now, you'd be like, what on earth? <laughs> well, we're going to get there. Um, <laughs> but um, Cal three is not so bad because it's literally just an extra variable they throw in there. So it's now in 3D. So instead of having just X and Y in two dimensions, you have X, Y, and Z, which is the same stuff. It's just, this is how you do a derivative with an extra variable. And this is how you do a der an anti-derivative with extra variable. It's not too bad. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it's like, we already got that. So that's a goal to get there, but <laughs> we got to do them in 2D first, which is a little bit challenging. <laughs> yes, yes. If you take university calculus, I think that's what they call it. Um, it does use Cal 2 stuff. The university does use it. Supposedly only uses Cal 1. But mm -hmm. like, if you do part two, because there's like part one and part two yeah, of university, yeah. part two will use the Cal 2. Yeah, they tell you that. The university is this one right now. Oh, and they're doing derivatives or they apply derivatives. It's all about rates, changes. Rates, the free body diagrams. Okay. So for this one, again, I'm still in 5.7. So I kind of have an idea, right, that we're going to be doing LNs. However, even if I didn't know that, um, between that numerator and that denominator, the numerator only has one term and the denominator has two terms. So essentially, my brain would have gone straight to that denominator as the U. Okay. So I would have done U equals one plus sine T. And then if I tried to do the derivative of this equation, um, this is going to be one with respect to u. The derivative of one is zero. The derivative of sine is negative cosine. And then I'm doing the derivative with respect to t. Now, if this helps, I'm going to keep doing this. One over one plus sine t. And then the cosine, I'm going to kick it out. So it's cosine of t dt. I'm just splitting that fraction again, right? Just tearing it apart into two factors. And as long as this expression is equivalent to that expression, we are totally allowed to do it. Now, the problem is, is do I have a negative next to my cosine? No. So I have to get rid of that over here so that I know exactly what to substitute for just cosine dt. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide by this coefficient in front here. It's like an invisible one, right? So then I get negative one du equal to just cosine of t dt. So now I know what to plug in for this, and I know what to plug in for that. So 
one plus sine t is actually u. And then cosine t dt is negative du. But remember, it's multiplied. So it's multiplied by a negative du. And even though it's a negative one, just the negative one, it's still a constant multiplier. So I can still kick it out to the very, very front, just like I did with the seven du before, right? We had a seven du and we kicked it out. Now we have a negative one du and we're still kicking that coefficient out. And if I apply that rule, this becomes ln of the absolute value of u plus c, and then fact sub what was u, and u was one plus sine t. So in here goes one plus sine t. Now, when I tell you all that these integrals are gonna get crazier, please don't get discouraged. Don't nobody drop. I'm not telling it to freak you out. I'm just, it's kind of gonna be more of a sense of accomplishment. You're gonna be like, oh my gosh, I did these crazy things and I'm, you don't know, check, <laughs> yay. Not trying to discourage, okay? You should be proud that you're gonna be doing crazy stuff. <laughs> I'm like, look what I can do. <laughs> For some people, it's not. Mm -hmm. Which, what's your degree plan? I think you do have to take Cal three. If you know. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. And it's. Yeah. And is it, do you have to take Cal 3 when you get to UTSA? I don't think so. I'm, I'm there now. I don't and you don't have to take Cal 3? Good. I took Cal, I, well, I was a math major, so I'm totally different, right? But I had to take Cal 3 at, at the university, and they let me use a graphing calculator in my Cal 1 and my Cal 2 class. And then I went over to UTSA, and they were like, oh, we don't use graphing calculators. That's why I don't let you use graphing calculators in this class, because that will happen. And then... You learned everything with a big fancy calculator. How do you go back and relearn everything without it, right? It's hard. So that was the whole reason why the department like agreed to not use graphing calculators in this class. Because everybody that's taking calculus, more than likely you're going to a university. The people who are not gonna be going to the university don't need to be taking calculus, okay? Um, and so they don't want you to get shocked <laughs> when you get over there. I mean, and it literally happened to me. So I know it happens. <laughs> and I wasn't the only one either. Right. Yeah. Okay. So this section is a little bit different. The five. Point eight. This one is about the inverse trig functions. So you can write them like this, arc sine, arc tan, arc secant. You could also write them like this, if you remember this notation. Remember that notation with the little inverse symbol up there? Like yeah. it looks like an exponent, but it's not, right? Um, the only reason why we try to stay away from this is because you could get sine to a negative one power, okay? Mm -hmm. And so we don't want you to get confused between the inverse of sine and then sine to the negative one power, okay? So that's why we don't use this in Cal 2. Um, but if you're trying to find the arc sine of a number, you do have to use this button right here because that is the arc sine, okay? The sine to the negative one button in your calculator. It's just as we work out the problems, we won't be using sine to the negative one. It's not that it happens a lot, but it could happen. And that's why we don't use that notation, okay? But your calculator still does. So when you get to like plugging in the numbers part, you might have to use those buttons. Um, okay, now the cool thing about these is that, well, one, there's only three of them that they give you for right now. It, we're not gonna get any more cra crazier than this for right now. When we get to chapter eight, we have to do something called uh, trig substitution. And you might see these arc signs and arc tangents again, but they're not gonna be used in the same way, okay? We'll have to go back to like trigonometry. Why does it start with TRI? Because there's triangles involved, right? So when we get to chapter eight, we'll be using those triangles again.
that's also a tough section, but I literally try my best to explain every single little aspect of it <laughs> so that you could get it, okay? Okay, so for these, if I look at all of these rules, there's only one that sticks out to me because notice that my denominator does not have a little house on it, right? Um, and I wouldn't be able to use U substitution because just direct U substitution without these things. Because if I were to let U equal that denominator thing, which is obviously the more complicated part of this expression, when you try to do du, zero, this becomes 50x, and then the dx is attached, right? But do you have that extra variable x in your problem? Like I can get rid of the 50, right? But I can't just make up variables and put them in there. Okay, so this little x, I don't have it anywhere in the numerator. Even if I split this up and I kick the 45 multiplier out and I write this like this instead, I still don't have this extra variable right here. Okay, I don't have it. So that's why I cannot use just direct u substitution. Okay. What they have us do instead is they have us do um, these kinds of substitutions. So you have to identify what is the number and what is the u. Now notice the format here. It's a number that's being squared. So in this case, isn't one squared still one? Now what squared would be 25 x squared? 5x, good. And so then really what we're gonna do, I should have crossed this out too, but I didn't, um, is I should be letting the a is the number. So a is what's inside this parentheses, which is one, and u is what's in the square as well, which is the 5x. Now that I know what u is, let's calculate what du is. So the derivative of u is one with respect to u. The derivative of five x is five with respect to x. Now we don't have to write one du, you could just write du. But I do have an issue. I don't have this five in here, right? All I have is dx all by itself, don't I? So then I can divide by five to get dx by itself. However, there's another option. I could have also torn this apart. Isn't four like nine times five? And so then if I tore that apart, I could have left the nine here and brought a five over there next to the dx if I really wanted to make that match the du, okay? I don't do it that way. I think I've mentioned it in a previous class that you can do that, but I just don't do it that way. I take what I have in here and I try to make it match and then I'll know what to substitute for it, okay? But you'll notice that that nine will come back. So we leave this alone. And then this is going to be A because one is A. This five X is going to be U. And then the dx is going to become du over five. This is a constant multiplier. If you think of it like this, one over five times du, right? So it is a constant multiplier, even though it looks like it's dividing, it's still a constant multiplier. So I can kick a constant multiplier out to the front. So you have 45 times this constant multiplier and then a squared plus u squared. And since the constant multiplier is out, there's just du there. And then what do I get over here then? That nine. Oh, why did I put an extra equals? But I'm actually gonna do the, antiderivative. 
So this follows this structure, right? And the antiderivative is one over a arctan of u over a. So one over a arctan of u over a. So I made my parentheses a little too big, but it's okay. And now we're just gonna plug back in what is a. A was one. U was five X. A is one again. And if I wanted to write this nice and neat, it would just be nine arc 10 of five X plus C. Right, that's just one, nine times one is nine. And then five X over one is just five X. Everything else stayed exactly the same. It wasn't this class, but I did have another class be like, well, how do you know what to do? You literally have to try, it's trial and error. You have to try something, let you be something, figure out what DU is, try to plug in the pieces. If you have extra bits that didn't get plugged in, then it didn't work. Try something else. Okay. Just if keep right like nine tangent inverse with five over x plus c on the test. Will that still work? Or do you want it to see the arc tangent? If you wrote this. Are you asking that? Correct. Yeah, both of these are good. And I believe WebAssign um, takes both of them as well. Mm-hmm. Now, it, you could have done the solution a little tiny bit differently, not too much differently, but a little bit differently. And it might not look exactly like mine is, but you're doing the same thing, okay? And that's okay. There, there's, I always tell people there's rules and then there's your style <laughs> with math. So as long as you're following all the rules, the way it looks might look a little bit different than the other person. I mean, we're all wearing shirts and pants, but everybody's shirts and pants looks different, right? So, but you're still getting a job done, your clothes, right? <laughs> it's the same thing with math, okay? Okay, so let's try another one. I'm gonna actually bring this one back because it has my little rules over here. So there's my three little rules. <clears throat> Does this one kind of look like any of those? Yes. Does it look like, here we'll number them. Does it look like rule one, rule two, or rule three? It does look like one. How do you know? Everything is under the little house. That is a perfect way to explain it. Yes. Mm -hmm. What's outside the x plus seven? It's a square. I'm sorry, my ugly writing. <laughs> You're good. <laughs> it's a little too. But yes, everything is in the house, right? Here, nothing is in the house, right? And here you have one little extra bit that's not in the house, right? But on one, everything is inside that house, okay? I am going to split it just because I'm going to take this constant multiplier out real quick. And then we'll start going from there. Again, this is my style. I like to make things look exactly like the rule before I get the rule. But there are some people that they don't need it to look, they don't need to have all the U's in there for them to apply the rule correctly. And by all means, if that's you and you're getting the answers right every time, then do you. But <laughs> for me, I have to do it, especially so I don't do anything wrong on accident because my brain does weird stuff sometimes. Mm -hmm. It is fun. Yeah. Oh, wow. Well, at least you have somebody helping you. <laughs> That's nice. Sure. <laughs> That's what my daughter says. I'm like, your mom's a math teacher. She's like, yeah, but I don't like when you help yeah, me. Exactly. So I'm like, what? I said I would do that all that. I'm like, yeah, I don't. She's like, how do you teach people? And I'm like, I don't know. Ask them. <laughs> my surveys say I'm doing okay, though. And the grades say I'm doing okay. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay. So here we're going to do the number part. This is the number part. But what number is that squared? Seven squared. And we got lucky here. I didn't have to mess with it because it's already something squared, isn't it? It already has it in parentheses with the square. So we're just going to let the U, or actually start with the A. A is the number. So the number that's being squared is seven. And then the U is the stuff with the X in it. And so that's going to be X plus seven. Now the DU I have to actually calculate. So the derivative of U is one with respect to U. The derivative of X is one. The derivative of seven is zero, but I'm doing the derivative with respect to X, right? So essentially DU is just equivalent to DX. So nice. I know what to plug in for that. It's gonna be DU. I know what to plug in this. It's gonna be U. And I know what to plug in for that. It's gonna be A. So let's go ahead and do that. So now I have a squared minus u squared, sorry for my writing, and then du. I don't like the way that little guy looks. There, it's a little bit better. I don't like it when I, she had a hiccups like for a brief moment, but I have had hiccups before for a whole class period and it was awful. Oh, it's like, I'm so sorry. <laughs> huh? I was at work and I hiccuped and I got that big old Vegas nerve, whatever. Oh, yes. Oh, I actually like passed out. <gasps> oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm done for today. Yeah. Where is it? The end of the day, so. Oh, so this one doesn't have like a little fraction. See how these two have the fractions? But yeah. that one does not. So it's just going to be arc sine and then u over a and then plus c. And so then we just back up, right? I don't really need that parentheses. And u was x plus 7 and a was 7 plus c. Do not tell me that the answer is this. We should know algebra better than that, right? Do those sevens cancel? One of them's being added and the other one's being divided. So of course they don't just undo each other, right? Subtraction undoes addition and multiplication undoes division, right? I don't have that here. What you could have done though was that, uh-huh. And then this would have been okay. That is correct, okay? because this guy's over seven, which is represented here, and seven over seven is represented there, okay? But this one is not a go. It happens, which is why I'm mentioning it, okay? People start making up rules and they're just like, oh, wipe out, nope, we get too excited there <laughs> to just cancel stuff. People do get cancel happy, it, happen it happens. I'm guilty of it too every now and then, so it happens. You just have to be careful. Okay, and yes, I think Trevor was the one that asked me earlier, but you could write that as sine inverse, right? So same thing, just sine inverse. Okay, now, oh, let me bring the little rules back. Which one does that kind of look like? Because mm -hmm, you got that extra little X outside the house, right? They have extra little X outside the house. So, oh, I got a chat. Give me one second. Oh, I didn't pay attention. I will see that later, but it was something about someone having to leave. So totally got it. <laughs> Don't worry about it, but I'll check the message to find out who it was when I come back. Um, just make sure whoever it was, they watch the recording when I post it. So anything that you missed, you'll still get it, okay? Okay, um, so yeah, it's going to be like this one. So then that kind of gives away what U is going to be. Oh, no, that does not give away. Don't use this guy to determine U. 
that is the biggest advice I can give you in this section is don't use the outside guy to determine what you is. Always use this guy to determine what you is. Okay. And the same thing. I did it for this one and I did it for that one, didn't I? I always used what was in the square to figure out what you was. It, we're going to apply that same concept here. Okay. So first thing I'm going to do is rewrite this so that I have those little squares on it. So something squared minus something else squared. So what is being squared here to get me x to the fourth? x squared. And what is being squared here to get 16? Four. Four. Good. And so this is where what u is. Okay. Not the outside guy. <clears throat> so u is going to be x squared, which means du, derivative of this is 1 with respect to u, derivative of this, 2x with respect to x. Oh, this is going to be weird. Mm -hmm. You are right. I should have identified A, right? What's A? Four. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's an issue, though, because is X DX the same as what I have? No, because my X is downstairs, isn't it? So that happens. Gosh. <laughs> I'm just going to substitute for this because I think what's going to happen is, is if I try to isolate dx, what am I going to end up with? Aren't I going to end up with an x downstairs, which is what I have? So let's look at that. Let's divide by 2 and x. Divide by 2 and x. So there they cancel and I have just dx. Over here, though, if I do that, I end up with 1 over 2x you again like I said, a lot of this is an error so we're gonna try it and see what happens okay if it leads me nowhere i have many other pages of paper it'll be fine <laughs> so we're gonna go see what happens when we do this and also what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna split up this fraction So I split this up into one over X times one over this. Okay, that's all I've done so far. I have not done any of my U subs yet. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna replace the X squared with U. I'm gonna replace the A for four. I'm gonna leave this one alone because I don't have anything for it, but I do have an expression for dx, don't I? It's one over two x du. Now I do see something that can happen actually now, because if I multiply those together, I get two x squared, don't I? Don't I have something for x squared? U is x squared, isn't it? So I'm going to use that now. This one was a little weird, but I had a feeling it was going to work out, but I wasn't sure how. But do I have everything in terms of u's now? Or do I still have it half and half where some has x and some has u's? The whole thing has u's now, right? But I am going to rewrite it a little bit differently so that it looks like my rule, OK? So the one thing I am going to do is kick this out. Remember, this fraction is the same thing as 1 half times 1 over u, right? So I need the u downstairs. What I don't need is this 2. There's no 2 over here, is there, in my rule? So I'm going to kick that 1 half out as a multiplier. So the one half comes all the way out to the front 
And I'm actually going to take this guy and multiply it by this fraction. So one times one is still one, but this radical times u is just u times that radical. And now it looks exactly like what I have for my rule three. This one's had a lot of algebra manipulation going on. So there's my constant multiplier. And then according to the rule, the antiderivative should be one over a arc secant, the absolute value of u over a plus c. So my one half is times that whole thing, okay? And you always tag the plus C on the side, right? But we do have to back, right? Our problem did not have U's and A's. It had X squared and four, right? So we'll go back and plug in those numbers. So this should have been four. U was actually, x squared, a was again four, close the big parentheses, plus c. Hmm? Yes, we get one eighth. Now your computer will want this as an answer. Why did the bars go away? And only sometimes do the bars go away, not always. Because it's squared. Mm -hmm. And if it's squared, doesn't it mean it's always positive? So you don't need the bars because we already know it's always gonna be positive. But if it were just X or X plus four or anything that doesn't have a square, we don't know when it's gonna be positive and when it's gonna be negative. So you do have to keep the bars, okay? The only reason these bars went away is because x squared itself is always positive. It's like, is that clock right? That is. Oh, our favorite, secant and tangent, right? <laughs> Does anybody have any questions about this one before I go to the next one? Let me try to get the whole problem in the view. Let me get rid of this little, there it goes. And some people, I, I don't like to do things the way some people's brains work. I like to do everything thoroughly explained and breaking it all apart and doing all of that so that you can actually see what's happening. But me personally, I probably would have done half of these steps if I were doing this problem, okay? Just because I can already visualize it, okay? But not everyone's like that and I don't expect you to be. So that's why I try to make it. <laughs> and it might seem overwhelming because you're like, oh my God, there's gobs and gobs and gobs of steps. But it doesn't require you to write all of these steps. You write what you feel you need to write, okay? Like me personally, I could have gone from here to probably here without having to write those two steps. And then from here, I probably would have been able to go to here just because I knew what U and A was. And then I would have O squared and not wrote the bars, okay? But that's, each person's gonna be different, okay? You just have to be very, very careful. Okay, last one I have for you. After that, we'll just work on WebAssign. Um, but we have this one here. As soon as you see squares and square squares, two terms with a square in the denominator, chances are it's going to be one of these, okay? 
And because a square with two terms in the denominator and a house, which one of these does that look like? Mm -hmm. You don't have no extra bits on the outside down here, do you? So it does look like number one. It's just a house all by itself. Now, first I'm going to do is split this fraction because it's supposed to have one on top. So I'm going to just have secant squared x dx on the side. And then in the house, I'm going to figure out what these squared bits are. So what squared gives you 16? Four. Four, good. And then what squared gives you 10 squared? It's easier than that. I need to know what do I need to square to get 10 squared? Tangent. If I take tangent, tangent, don't I get tangent squared? Oh, I said right? <laughs> It's not too really complicated. <laughs> but then now, because I have that inside the house, right, that is going to be the U. The squared part is where the U comes from. So on the side, I'm going to say U equals that variable part inside the square. Now, the derivative of U is 1 with respect to U. The derivative of tangent X is secant squared X, but again, with respect to X, right? So we got lucky on that one because don't we have that exact thing, right? So then this becomes a squared minus u squared. And then all of this, I could either write one do or I could just write du, right? Isn't it the same thing? If I write x or one x, it's the same thing. So then applying rule one, we get arc sine of u over a plus c. And then here I'm going to have 10x is my u. And oh, I didn't even write what a was. I didn't write it, but I substituted it, didn't I? <laughs> You're right, it is four. So there should be a four down here. Usually A is the first thing I write, but I kind of forgot it the last two problems. And you don't have to mess with this anymore. You can't leave it like that, okay? You don't need to apply any trig rules or anything like that. As long as you've done the antiderivative, like you're good. I usually just reduce like numbers. Like if I have four over four, then of course I want to cancel them, right? But to be able to do the arc ten of this, that's the arc sine of tangent, that's a little more complicated. So I would just leave it like that. And then again, you could write your answer like this as well. It's the same thing. Well, those are all the ones I have. I'm hoping that with um, what you have in the videos, plus now what we have from class that you should be able to get through the whole homework assignment. But if you work on it, cause I think it is due tomorrow night. Yeah. Um, so if you work on it and get stuck on it, let me know so that we can talk about those, okay? And if you're trying to get it done before, cause tomorrow's the, tomorrow night is the deadline, right? Yeah. So, text me your questions. Don't wait until I see you for class time to ask the question, okay? Text me the question. You could take a picture of the problem, take a picture of what you've done so far. We'll walk you through it. You'll get your point for the problem, right? And then when we come to class, those will be the ones that I talk about because someone got stuck on them. It's more than likely that more than one person got stuck on those, okay? Any other questions? 
I know you said you would provide the formulas on the test. Are we able to just like print them out for ourselves or we can only use what you give us on the test? Like you won't be able, you should only on have site. blank paper on when you're on the test. Okay. So when you, cause you're in the remote class. So when you do the video recording, you'll basically be like, look, these are the papers I'm using. They're all blank. And then that's it. So you will just have the formulas that I have on the review. So whatever you see on that review, will be the same thing that you have during the test. So if there's any like little, doesn't mean you can't do a memory dump, okay? I, it's a weird word, but <laughs> but if you were to ha like do the review and notice that there were like certain trig formulas or certain something that wasn't in that list of formulas that I gave you, but you're like, I use this on the review, so maybe it might be on the test. Just try to have like a, uh, a note card with all them little, because it's not going to be a lot because that note sheet in the review is like long. It's like every theorem and property that was in the whole chapter. Okay. <laughs> so I'll show it to you if you want to see it actually. Oh, oh. Um, I have the one that you posted online that I use. No, it is not the same one. So let okay. me go to the modules because that one just had antiderivatives, derivatives, and a little bit of trig functions. So right. if I actually go to the review, um, oh, dang, I didn't put it in this class yet. Modules. It will be up later, either later today or by tomorrow. It's uh, up. But if I open this, you'll see all of the, nope, I didn't publish it yet. I probably didn't stick the stuff in there yet. I know I did it on the calculus class, but the Cal 2 class, it should have it in there. I just might not have put it in y'all's yet. No, I don't have it in here either. So I got to put it in there. I'll show you an example of what it looks like though. So if I go to my Cal 1, I thought I had done this last week. I guess I didn't. Well, I will do it today. Uh, but looking at their review, you'll have everything. So anything that I used, any theorem or property that I used while I did the test myself goes in the testing. So you literally have like all theorems from out the whole section and anything else extra that you might need, like the derivative chart or the integral chart or the um, trig functions and stuff like that. But it's everything. Absolutely. This is Cal 1, right? But it is everything that you'll need. Okay. I don't leave anything out. So like those rules that you just had the three on the side for us, we have those provided. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, sure, sure, you... sure. So um, Alexander's question was, so like these things, oh, you can't see my camera. These things you would have on the note sheet, okay? All the basic traits. Can I borrow your little paper again that you have? Because this one will definitely be on there. So this one, I think, is the one that I have printed. This yeah, is only one, one of the many things that will be in the test itself. So you will have all the derivative rules, all of the integration rules. You'll have all these. Have, yeah, that's what I printed out. Yeah, you'll have all of that. It'll be in the test itself. Okay. And then. But there will be extras, like any little tiny thing that I needed extra outside that sheet of paper, I will have it in there. Do you mind if we do our scratch work on tablets or do you want it specifically on regular paper? You are not allowed to have any kind of electronic device other than this regular calculator while you're taking the test. So you definitely cannot use a tablet because if you have a tablet while you're taking the test, um, it will put you into like academic dishonesty and all this other jargon because you're using equipment that you're not allowed to use during the test. So sorry, I know that we have tablet lovers. <laughs> they like to have everything there and then notes and all that. And it makes it super easy electronically to send stuff. I'm sorry, but we just don't have technology to monitor what you're doing on that tablet while you're taking the test. So it, it violates your test security. But I'm glad you asked. I am too. <laughs> 
some people do write on top and it's so nice because they can like zoom in and zoom out and I'm it's fancy but <laughs> is there any other questions I mean I'm still going to be hanging out in here but you guys are free to work on your web assign to knock that out to get it done as much as possible I think we still have about 15 minutes I can I can open it right now so I don't know if you guys did you guys hear from the remote she asked if there were old sections that you weren't able to get to in the web assign if I would reopen them and I'm just going to go ahead and reopen them now hope I can remember my password And I'll actually make the deadline Sunday, the night before the test. Also, I am going to put in those formulas. It's not gonna take me very long, but I am going to put in those formulas um, today. So I would suggest that you look at the test review. And if there's any problems in there that you want me to talk about um, on Wednesday, to let me know, okay? Because we're going to start the class with those specific problems. Um, because I don't know that we'll have, I mean, we go over like eight of them in class. I'm not sure we'll be able to go over all of them on the review. So definitely pick out the ones you want me to cover for sure. And I don't know my password. I always have it automatic, so bad. <laughs> I think that's it. Nope, didn't like it. No. Does not like it. Let me go check Google. That's why I love iPhones it saves on my purchase. Yes, and my I'm logged in on my Google account so it remembers them, but so not over here. Someone's <laughs> like, you could just log on the school computers, and I'm like, I don't know the password. <laughs> The for the oh, Aces the, yeah, any of them? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe changes coming. Oh, like it is totally different than what I thought it was. If Ellen X is a name, the derivative of that would be nope, it requires chain rule. So you do the power rule and then you multiply by the derivative of ln of x. So it would be eight ln. No, it would be no. Uh -huh. It would be eight ln one over x. No, no. And what was it? Eight power. So it'll be seven now. And then you do. This is what you had to begin with, right? Yeah. No. So you bring no. It just says ln. Oh, this. Yes. Like that. Yes. That's different. Then that one is <laughs> one over x to the, times the derivative of x to the eighth. So it ends up being what eight over x. You know, remember, you know what? I'm just gonna do this on my phone. I have a question from sure. Richard. I have 5.4. 5.4. Okay, I'm going to get my paper. Which problem is it? Uh, 10. 10. And it was going to be because I'm stupid, but you're not. <laughs> I know that's not the problem. <laughs> 5. 5. Point what? 5.4. 5.4, number 10. So the bounder are pi over 6, negative pi over 6. And the integral of a taking squared x. Dx or more? Uh, dx. Mm -hmm. I always forget to write that. So like this one? Oh, you can't see. <laughs> that would help. <laughs> uh, yes. So I got it down to, so the, this is why I really need to be careful what I write. Derivative of that or the antiderivative would be 8 tan u. 8 tan x. 8, yeah, x. Mm -hmm. And then you evaluate. The bounds would be the pi over 6 to negative pi over 6. Mm -hmm. 
And so then you do the integral. So 18 pi over 6 minus 18 pi over negative pi over 6. Mm -hmm. And somehow the answer was 16 over square root of 3. Mm -hmm. How? That's clear. Tangent of pi over 6 is square root of 3 over 3. And then tan of negative pi over 6 is negative square root of 3 over 3. So this is 8 square root of 3 over 3. These are a plus 8 square root of 3 over 3, which makes 16 square root of 3 over 3. Mine mm -hmm. was 7, so it's 14. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is the answer. So I put in a decimal the first time, and that it might also say that this is the answer. Is this the one you were saying? Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. It's just this one's been, this one has been rationalized. Square root of three, square root of three. So it's just taking, like, so you just take out the coefficient, which would be the eights, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then the pi over six you get from the unit circle. Mm -hmm. Or the calculator. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I use a calculator. I'm trying to get away from my calculator because my mm -hmm. calculator is the inspire and I haven't gotten the the other one. Then yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, pi over six is on the student circle. Mm -hmm. If it were pi over seven, it would be a different story. But yeah, this one's good. Mm -hmm. So this one though, you'd have to go in the other direction, right? So it'd be here, which is eleven pi over six. So yeah, you would find the tangent of 11 pi over 6 for this one, and then find the tangent of just pi over 6 for this one. So if you do, because what is it like? One half over square root of three over two, which is just one over square root of three. But if I rationalize it, it's square root of three over three. So whether you use this or whether you use this or the same thing. Oh, okay, and that's how I got the 16 over square root of three. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so the tangent is, uh, Sine over cosine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I never should have thrown away my very first unit circle that dragon's all up Yeah, the big giant one. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me. I'm going to open up all of chapter five until Sunday night. Which is what date? I'm slightly very good at the moment. It is 18. <laughs> 18. I swear I put those formulas in there. I must not have hit save. This is so weird. I keep everything. Well, I have them saved in my <laughs> folder, so I'll just put yeah. them in there. <laughs> Not there. Nine eighteen. Multi select. <laughs> I just have a list of what I can't do. <laughs> what they mean. <laughs> well, Shamadol is a narcotic, and all narcotics do is put me to sleep. And then Promethazine and antihistamine is like a high powered Benadryl. And I'm pretty much convinced Benadryl does nothing but put you to sleep so you forget that there's something wrong in the first place. Um, my husband uses my anti anxiety meds to knock his butt out. And it does, like a freaking train yard. And he's just like, You take three of these a day. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> I've never taken anti anxiety. I know I have anxiety. I've had four. 
but my but, boyfriend does too. But I'm clinically depressed with OCD and bipolar and say. anxiety. <laughs> That's hilarious. He's just like, man, Alex, I take one of these and I'm out for like 10 hours. And I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. It kind of took me off. Well, my 